Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to the Schubert seminar. Uh, before we start, I want to remind you that our next talk uh, is uh, on Monday, October the 10th. So we're getting back to the to the original schedule. But uh, today we're very happy to have uh, Professor Andre Okunko from Colombia with a special talk on uh, Eisenstein meets Schubert. So please take it away, Andre. Thanks, Leonardo. So this is I. Yeah, it's really I'm really grateful for this opportunity to speak, and I'm also uh, appreciate you guys meeting at a special time to somehow to avoid uh, conflict with my my teaching here in Berkeley. So, uh, so this is the um, uh, what we're going to talk about is a subject which is, you know, kind of new to me. So I, uh, yeah, I, you know, you'll see my command of the material is somewhat limited. So <laughs> I'll try my best to explain. So uh, of course, in real life, Eisenstein and Schubert, I don't think they uh, met because uh, they overlap maybe by four years or so, but. Uh, so Eisenstein lived a very, uh, very uh, short, uh, influential, and tragic life. And so by the time he uh, he left this world, I think Schubert was three or four years old. So I don't think they they met. A anyway, um, so uh, so what is this about? So maybe I'll start with a discussion of Eisenstein series and uh, um, what what is the what's the subject is about. So uh, this is I I. I'll give you the general definitions, but then, of course, I think it's much more informative to um, much more informative to to see what these definitions look like when I specialize them in most important examples. So, while well, well, I present the general definition, we I think I think the examples are um, is really the place to learn. And so, in, in principle, there's uh, if I have uh, so let's take there's a we'll take a reductive group. We'll take today we'll take a split. And uh, we will uh, will be a group over uh, a global field, which is noted bold face F, black bold, uh, black bold, bold face F. And then you can form this double quotient when uh, of the adelic points of that group. Uh, on the one side, you mod out by the uh, by the F valued points of the group acting di embedded in the adels diagonally, and on the other side, you mod out by the maximal compact subgroup. And for the reasons that will be explained below, this is people tend to use, denote this double quotient by bun. And uh, this is some set and uh, has a natural measure. And so it's natural to study uh, L2 of that measure. And in particular, we would like to decompose or many people would like to decompose the L2 with respect to the action of um, something called Hickey operators and so on. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what this thing is. But like I said, maybe the best, so best to turn to examples. And so what kind of, so what is a global field? A global field is either a finite extension of Q or a field of functions over a, a curve defined over a finite field. And so if my field is Q and my group is SL, then this, this double quotient becomes the double quotient when you take real points of SLN and mod them out on, on the one side by integer by SLN Z, and on the other side by SLN, by the maximal compact, which is SONR. And geometrically, this is this represents, uh, well, we'll review in a second, this represents is a space of lattices in Rn normalized to have co-volume one, this is the volume of fundamental domain is equal to one, and taken up to isometry. And where where is the where is the uh, Hecke operators? What what are the Hecke operators? Hecke operators in this case in, involve first of all, if I have a lattice in Rn, I can consider its gram matrix. And its gram matrix is uh, is an element in this SLNR mod S O N R, and that's a that's a, a that's a homogeneous space, and that's a negatively curved and invariant differential operator on this homogeneous space, they, they, that's part of the Hickey operators, particularly Laplace operator on this homogeneous space. But you also have some discrete, some kind of discrete versions of like a finite difference operators. And this come from the fact that if I have a function defined on lattices, you can sum it over uh, the following finite set. You can consider sub lattices, sub lattices in your given lattice such that the quotient has a fixed isomorphism type. 
and that would be there'll be some finite sum and if you have a function of lattice you can you know sum it over that finite set and that would be uh, that would be the action of your Hecke operators okay. so concretely so what's this somehow concretely if I have how would I define a lattice in in an dimensional space, well, I pick a, lat, a, ba a basis of vectors with a determinant, so a basis square matrix with determinant one, so it defines me a basis of vectors such that the, the parallel pipe, the fundamental parallel pipe is spanned by those vectors uh, has volume one. So they generate the lattice of co-volume one. And then um, and then the two bases, two bases, two, you know, two such sets of vectors generally the same lattice if, if and only if they differ by a matrix in SL and Z. And so therefore, unimodal lattices correspond to the points of this quotient. Uh, if I take one SL and R by SL and Z. <laughs> and if I'd like to study lattices up to orthogonal transformation, then of course I have to mod out by orthogonal transformations on the other side. So that would be space of lattices up to isometry. And if I, uh, in particular, my pictures here are two-dimensional pictures, and if I, in this particular two-dimensional case, that quotient is the is the familiar quotient of the upper half plane by S L and Z. So this figure, which you presume all of you seen, and so this is some some nice some nice uh, surface with three special kind of three special points. Two are the lattices that have extra automorphisms, and and also has this cusp. This, uh, you know, some go, yeah, it's a place where it goes to infinity. So in particular, it's, it's non-compact and this is non-compactness is reflected by the fact that if I have a unimodal lattice, the way it can degenerate is that it can have one vector to be very short. And so that's, uh, that's uh, is that the shortest vector gets shorter and shorter, I go into that cusp. And so since I have, uh, I have this uh, Riemannian manifold. When this, so it's a Riemannian manifold, and that's um, it uh, has it's non-compact, but this has uh, kind of this exponentially thin neck going into the cusp. Then I get uh, if I study the spectrum of Laplace operator on this manifold, this will be it will consist of some discrete and also some continuous spectrum. And this is generally the feature. So if in general, if I study all of the spaces, there, there's a there's a spectrum, the spectrum of Hall plus operator and the Hecke operator, some mixture of discrete and continuous spectrum. So um, another kind of global field is is if I take a curve defined over so let let, let little k be a finite field, and if I have a, a curve defined over that fi finite field, then the functions on this curve would form a global field. So my F would be functions on some curve defined over a finite field. And then the maximal compact subgroup are these are, are simply the matrices with value or the group group elements that this value is in integral adels of the of that of my global field. And in this sense case this double quotient has also very concrete geometric description. So for, for a number field it's some kind of space of lattices and for um, and for a function field, uh, those are just k valued points of the stack of G. G. So you have a group, you have a stack of G bundles of for, for that group G over your finite over your curve C. And, and this, this double quotient is really a those are the really the k valued points of that stack. And so concretely, if my group is JLN or SLN, so let's say JLN, then that stack is just a stack of vector bundles of rank n of on my uh, on my curve, uh, so you know, scale values points would be some countable set, and uh, and so if I have uh, vector bundles, then similarly, just like those lattices, if I have a function defined a function of a vector bundle, I can sum over over uh, sub bundles such that the uh, such that the um, the isomorphism type of the torsion shift. V mod v, v prime is fixed, and so this gives me this gives me a whole bunch of this this these operators give me a whole bunch of uh, invariant finite difference operators, and they're parameterized by uh, first of all by points of my curve, by closed points of the curve, and also by um, so if I in general if a general group G is parameterized by some double cosets. 
uh, but so for um, uh, for for GLN that has a maybe more concrete description. But so those are those are the things that I'd like to study. And uh, when I, uh, as I said already before, that the, the, the space is non-compact and, and concretely, so if I think of uh, going back to uh, SLN over, over Q, so unimodal lattice is up to isometry, then uh, for if I, uh, if, if the red is of rank two, then the way it's going to degenerate is, uh, is some vector, the shortest vector will become very short. But if I have some rank n lattice, then then the way it's going to degenerate is that if I choose like the shortest vector, then the the next shortest not in the span of the first one, and so on and so forth, then some of this will become you know, the the distance the difference in the norm between some of them will become very very large. Like for instance, could be I can have you know two two vectors which are much much shorter than the third one not in their span, and so the, so this is this is uh, this is this is to say, I, I'd like to choose in my my sequence of vectors where all, in principle, I all have less or equal signs. Some of these less or equal signs, I have to switch to the less less signs, uh, and that this is equivalent to a data of a parabolic subgroup in SLN, and that's that's a general pattern. So, uh, in general, if you look at the boundary of that space, that is stratified by by strata corresponding to um, to uh, different parabolics in your group. And uh, reflecting this stratification, Langlands long time ago. So uh, Langlands fundamental work on the subject was done some like early 60s, uh, has been you know, I mean, appeared in, in, in print, maybe sometimes in the 70s, but uh, somehow it's, it's very, very classical. And so, uh, so anyway, first step of that, work is that um, is uh, Langlands proves the decomposition um, of this L2 on the bundles uh, in terms of parabolic subgroup up to a certain equivalence relation. And this is this is roughly saying this is this means that the kind of a function comes your eigenfunction comes from that part of the boundary. So so uh, and there's the spectral projections on the corresponding on the corresponding pieces, they have to do with the operators of constant terms. And so what that means concretely for SL2, so if I have a, uh, uh, if I have a function on SL2, on upper half plane most as SL2z, then I can, um, I can integrate it uh, along the, so going back, going in my fundamental domain, I can integrate it for fixed value of, of, of the y coordinate that I integrated from in x from minus one half to over, over the period in x, it's periodic, it's a periodic function in x. I can integrate it, um, integrate it um, uh, if that integral is non-zero, then uh, it's some function of y, then if that integral is non-zero, then the, that is, that's the part, that's the constant term that corresponds to the part of the function, which actually kind of supported on that part of the boundary. The rest, the rest is, uh, the rest decays super exponential if I go into the, into the cusp. And this decomposition, there is, there's one piece that corresponds kind of the bulk of the space, the group itself. That means those are the cusp form and they, uh, they just compactly, in, in the case of a function field, they just compactly support it. In the case of a number field, they are decay very, very fast as you go, as you go to, as you go to infinity. And, uh, and that's, of course, very important. That's a very important part of the decomposition. But uh, in the theory of Eisenstein series, this is treated as a black box. And the theory of, and the theory of Eisenstein series seeks to reconstruct the rest of L2 starting from cusp forms on smaller subgroup, namely on Levy subgroup of the corresponding parabolics. Um, and so, so Eisenstein series, they take, uh, they take a function on Levy subgroup and you can assume it's already, so I'm, you're trying to understand the world, this, this picture inductively. So you can already assume that this is a, a sort of a cusp form and second already eigenfunction of, of all Hickey operators. And so you take that function as an input and you produce a family of Heike eigen function on the whole group G. And uh, this, uh, these functions are never on L2. We'll, we'll, see, we'll see an example. But their linear span contains the corresponding 
the corresponding uh, piece of the L two decomposition, and and the problem. So so the problems you have. So you have a eigenfunction which are not square normalizable. You would like to know in their linear span which is which are the things which are which are square normalizable and what is the spectrum on this on that part. So that's you know that's kind of a that that's that's a pretty standard problem like a quantum mechanics when you know something about uh, I mean if you if you you know you you have some differential equation and you 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 know something about its solutions but uh, you understand well the cases which the the solution is not square normalizable you would like to know what was the actual spectrum of differential operator so it's kind of a pretty pretty standard setup in in in, in uh, in you know, analysis of operators, quantum mechanics, but here, here, here we have a particular setting in which there is a particular interest in understanding that spectrum, and 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 today uh, we will start from the end. So I already said that this is the the Eisenstein series is some procedure that starts from uh, from uh, a cusp form on a smaller sub on the Levy subgroup of your original group, and produces some interesting function on on the whole group. <clears throat> And then, uh, uh, and then, of course, it's natural to maybe start from the end, which is the farthest, the farthest from cusp form. So, so in this decomposition, we'll start from the minim minimal possible parabolic subgroup, namely for Borel subgroup. And um, so that is to say, we start from the generic bond. So the the um, the cusp form corresponds like the bulk of the space bond, and we would like to instead go to the most generic strat of the boundary. And there on the boundaries, there's, uh, you know, the, the Levy subgroup, there is a torus and uh, there's not the harmonic analysis on the torus. It, it's interesting, but maybe not so super interesting. So we might as well start with the function one, which is let the somehow already, uh, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's, the general gen general character of a torus maybe is only slightly more interesting than function one. So let's just start with a trivial trivial character. And so then we'll denote the corresponding space is just this L2 of Eisenstein series, although meaning we have the, the most kind of the most basic Eisenstein series. This would be this would be the series that for SL2 Eisenstein actually studied. So um, and so there's some definition what these things are in terms of uh, you have a self decomposition on your group. I, I, I don't know. I mean, you there's there's a, the slides are on my web page, and uh, I can maybe put a reference to that in in the chat. But maybe instead of explaining how this goes in terms of a self decomposition and so forth, let's just uh, let me uh, so. You know, if you if you haven't seen it before, maybe you'll, maybe maybe it's best to to go straight to the example. And an example: What is it for SL2Q? For SL2Q, so I have a space of lattices in two dimensions, taken up to up to isometry. And how? So I need to produce a function of a lattice and and one more variable. And how would I do that? I, I, I sum over all primitive vectors in my lattice. And, uh, and then I take the norm of the primitive vector and I raise it to the power, the correct power to take is lambda plus one. And this one is the, is the row for, for SL2. And so in general, it's, if, you, if you paid attention to the previous slide, there was a shift by row. Uh, and so this is for SL2 is one. And so that's, um, and so you sum you sum over all in other words you sum over all um, so I'm just repeating myself primitive vectors in your lattice and you take their norm and you raise it to some power so there'll be some function of a lattice if this power is if this power is big enough then this this series will converge and will give you some function of a lattice and uh, maybe one thing to notice is that uh, what are the primitive vectors modulo plus minus one? Those are the same as rational points, as rational points uh, of P1. And in general, the uh, the Eisenstein series for SL2, those are just, this would be a sum over P1 over your field with some notion and what re replaces the norm is, is, is really the notion of a height of the corresponding point in P1. So, um, 
So this is and and right and 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 I put one half in front is just because uh, you know plus minus primitive vector correspond to the same point in P one and so it's it's we we're, we're really doing that summation and then uh, how this relates to other forms of Eisenstein series you might have seen well sometimes people sum not over primitive vectors but over all vectors but the sum over primitive vectors and over all vectors they differ by just a zeta function, because if you have if you have sum over all multiples of a given vector, you get you get a factor of a zeta function. Is that is that make is that clear? No. Sounds cool. good. So, and this is this is this is called the Eisenstein series, and then uh, what's called pseudo Eisenstein series is imagine you have the same sum, but now you took. Um, a smooth compactly supported functions on positive reals and instead of summing norm instead of sum, summing norm to some power you sum the value of this function on the norm so you get some object which is now linearly depends on f and the relation and the relation between what we have on this slide and what we had on the previous slide is just Milin transform on the group r plus the multiplicative group of positive real numbers that you, you know, those are the powers are the characters the powers are the characters of that group and then generally if you have a function of a group you want to do somehow decompose it into the characters there's a there's a general Fourier transform which for a multiplicative group of positive real numbers is usually called Milin transform and uh, the reason to introduce the reason one introduces the series is because this function is visibly so if f is um, a compactly supported function that this is visibly an l2 in your group whether the previous function like i said is never an l2 and we'll in fact we'll see in in a second that it's never an l2 but so this is this is <clears throat> A slightly technical point, but this is if you'd like to generate, if you'd like to actually generate the span in L2 of Eisenstein series, this is the, you, this is how you do it. You instead consider the pseudo Eisenstein series and they span, they actually span the corresponding part of L2 or rather than subset of them. So, um, so what would that be for SLN? Well, for SLN is you can anticipate what's going to be replacement of a of, of, of a primitive vector. So a primitive vector was really, you take, uh, you took a, a rational subspace and you choose the generator of the corresponding, of the corresponding of, you had a lattice, you take a rational subspace, you take, you take the generator of the, of the group of the intersection. So for, for SLN, you take a flag of rational subspaces. So then you have this induced lattices and you, you look at their volumes rather you know like the determinant so you have a determinant of the intersection of your lattice with the corresponding subspace and that would be this would be a, a height zeta function for now flag manifold of your of your um uh so uh, i mean this 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 is a so you measure a height of a, of of a rational point using some line bundle of course for flag manifold there are many line bundles and uh, and if you record the heights with you know as a function of a line bundle, you get you get some expression like this. And this is so it's generally it's, it's expressions like this are called high zeta functions in uh, in some sort of arithmetic geometry. But I mean concretely, this is this is what it is. So you measure you take these flags of subspaces and you measure in some sense like you know some some norm of that flag. Uh, and then, uh, and then, if you have a function field, what is it? If a function field, you have a uh, so an analog analog of a for a function field is a G bundle over your curve. And so, if I have a G bundle over your curve, then you also have a G mod B bundle, the associated G mod B bundle, namely just the quotient of your principal bundle by the by the subgroup B. And then uh, the analog of of of, um, of this rational, I mean, this analog of this kind of rational points of that of that G mod B are the you you count the sections of that G mod B bundle over your curve according to their degree, 
and so then uh, and then shifted by rho, and so that's that's really a generator. So this is a super familiar object to anybody who's done you know some kind of ground within theory. So you just really go and count sections of some vibration, you know, curves in some geometry weighted by the degree, and again the degree here is a, is a vector, so you get a weighting by some monomial, and so that's uh, that's uh, so that's the kind of object what Eisenstein series is for. In this, in this, you know, in this example, Eisenstein series is this generating function. So it's a function. So it's a function over G bundle. For every G bundle, we have associated G mod B bundle. And uh, what we would like to do with the G mod B bundle is just count all sections according to their degree. So that seems like a reasonable thing to do. Uh, and and I uh, further Langlands proves. A general fact that Eisenstein series. So Eisenstein series were all were uh, were defined. Uh, so all the series I consider, there's you know, some series has some radius, some some region of convergence. Like for you know maybe I'm going here, this was convergent for for lambda from the real part of lambda sufficiently large. Uh, and that Eisenstein's uh, long language proves so that there is a. a Analytic continuation and functional equation that this thing satisfies. So maybe I'll go back to the transparency. So there's analytic continuation. So in general, so the, the, the region of convergence is some kind of positive veil chamber. And then uh, analytic continuation to other parts of the space of lambdas. This is, uh, this is like the action of, of W. And in fact, and in fact, if you analytically continue to some other part, then you get some constant that depends on lambda. Very interesting concept, be kind of important for what, what's happening. And like I said, all of this uh, series are eigenfunctions of uh, of Heike operators, and their their eigenvalues are always W invariant. And therefore, uh, and moreover, so and moreover, their uh, their eigenvalues are W invariant and lambda. Uh, in if you have a field of characteristic zero. And in fact, they're depend on Q to the lambda only if you have a, a field over a finite field with Q elements. And so in particular, their, their uh, Q to the lambda is a function which is 2 pi i over log Q periodic in lambda. So the Eisenstein spectrum is therefore abstractly a subset in this bold face lambda. This bold face lambda will be important. And that where the bold face lambda is either a Lie, the Lie algebra of the Langlands dual torus or the Langlands dual torus itself. And, and for now, we all we need to know about Langlands dual torus is the torus dual to, to the maximal torus of your Borel subgroup. So that's, that's, uh, that's uh, nothing, nothing further is required. So, um, and uh, so what does, what does the spectrum look for SL2 again? So we, we, had, we had this expression. And with this expression, one can uh, just kind of eyeball this expression and see that, uh, so we, we would like to understand some sort of, uh, you know, what this expression looks like in the cusp of my fundamental domain. And by, kind of, like I said, by some kind of eyeballing of this expression, one can see the following fact that there is, uh, it has the following asymptotic form in, uh, as so, as a, so, why is the imaginary part of that is the you know the coordinate going into the cusp that it has this asymptotic form, which which if you're I know it's not a quantum mechanics seminar it's a Schubert seminar but if you're if you if, if for those of you somehow interested in differential operators you would recognize that there's some kind of like incomic and reflected wave if you'd like and so. Um, uh, in any way, so this is, has this expression, and we have to pay attention to both the coefficient, the sort of reflection coefficient, which is a, which contains in itself some slightly modified version of the Riemann zeta function. This is called the completed zeta function, and also to the exponents. So, so the exponents say that from the exponents you see that this is never an L2 because uh, the uh, the measure of integration at dv, dx dy over y square. And you can never, if, if you square this expression, there will always be at least one term which is not integrable with respect to that measure. And um, however, if I look at it more closely, then uh, then I realize that 
if my lambda is purely imaginary, then uh, then this is borderline L2. So the, the, the integral, well, the L2 norm diverges, but just only only borderline diverges. So so it makes sense it will contribute to the discrete spectrum, and in fact, the discrete spectrum will com contribute the expression lambda. I mean, contribute the expression from going from minus infinity to minus one fourth, and as this famous one fourth. But uh, but uh, another feature is that uh, this, like I said, this psi, some kind of version of this is, is completed version of the Riemann zeta function. And in particular, it has a pole at lambda equals one. And so if I pick the residue of that, of that pole, then I get a constant function. And a constant function certainly is an eigenfunction of Laplace operator, and moreover, it's square integrable. Which is actually an L2. So it's not constant function is not an Eisenstein series, but it's a residue in a pole of an Eisenstein series. So that's a that's the kind of that's a, that's that's and that's and that's the complete description of the Eisenstein spectrum for us L2. And there's the following very non-obvious way to state this result, somehow also due to Langlands, and that's um, in this you know, later later additions by Arthur and many other brilliant mathematicians. So this is, this is, uh, this, uh, you, you can say that like, 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 result like this. Well, let's think of a matrix lambda minus lambda. So let's think of lambda, the eigenvalue as, as being a uh, matrix, like lambda minus lambda. Uh, and let's consider the equation that it's commented with some unknown matrix E is twice time E. And then uh, this at once implies that E is a nilpotent matrix. And so there is a particular solution named the characteristic of that nilpotent matrix. So for any Lie algebra, there is a finite set of, uh, of semi-simple elements called characteristics of nilpotent elements. And so, uh, and then the above description of the spectrum, you can phrase as saying that this mat uh, the, the Eisen some lambdas in the spectrum, this happens if and only if, this lambda minus lambda equals the characteristic modulo the maximal compact subgroup in the centralizer of nilpotent element. So it's clear if you have a nilpotent element, then characteristic is defined only in the solution of this H commutator E equals to E is only defined up to up to centralizer of E. And uh, what you the, the ambiguity that you're allowed to take is in the Lie algebra of the centralizer. Of the maximal compact in the central line. So, well, how does this work in this example? So, if E is non zero nilpotent, then this characteristic is one minus one. It's, it's centralizer of nilpotent is unipotent. So, it has no, its maximal compact is trivial, its Lie algebra is zero, and we conclude that lambda equals to one. The other possibility is we have the zero nilpotent. And then this characteristic is also zero. However, it's the, the centralizer is everything. The maximal compact in the centralizer SU2. And this for we conclude that lambda has to be purely matched. So that's uh, so this is this is a general principle. So as envisioned by Langlands, this the general principle has to do with the fact that this this lambda, which is the space of all possible lambda modulo W. These are the semi-simple conjugacy classes in either the Lie algebra or the Lie group, the Langlands, the Lie algebra of the Langlands the Lie group, or or the on the group itself. And the way to state the spectrum is to consider better. It's better. So nilpotent elements are the same as SL2 triples, and so let's let's consider a homomorphism from SL2 to the Lie algebra of the Langlands the Lie group. And we need the centralizer of that homomorphism, C sub phi. And then of course we denote by H in E, we denote the images of the standard H in E. And so the, 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 the main theorem we proved was that, I mean, not the main, the theorem we proved in David in the first installment of, 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 our, of our paper is the following. It's, it's really, so it's really, so Langlands himself did these computations for, for all groups of rank two in his in his fundamental work on the subject, and the computations for G two were kind of amazing computations, just just unbelievable how he could, he was able to do it for G two. It's it's pretty amazing. Uh, and then many people did it for many different groups, and uh, and uh, uh, so I guess we were the first to 
A do it for E8 and B do it uniformly for all groups. But uh, but uh, but of course, yeah, I shouldn't. You know, I shouldn't really. I mean, I should really hide the fact that this is this is this is some sort of a. I mean, this is this is a great piece of mathematics, largely not due to us at all. I mean, it's, it's by Langlands and many many people. We have this. We have this. You know, point of view, which is you know, I I hope people will appreciate, but it's not to belittle the contribution of others. Uh, and so anyway, the answer is that this, this spectrum is always the image. You take the union over all, um, over all conjugacy class of cell to homomorphisms and you take, well, in the additive case, you do half the characteristic plus the Lie algebra of the maximal compact or in the group, in the positive characteristic, you take Q to the characteristic of, well, over two plus the actual compact, plus the actual compact subgroup. And, and, and not only we determine the spectrum, we'll actually give an explicit formula for the spectral decomposition. So, so uh, and the first step, so I'm a little behind the schedule here, but it's okay. So as the first step is we, it's the same as Langland. So we, we, we our first step is, uh, is just the same as Langland's. It says, it says, so Langland's what he did. The reason I discussed the reason I discussed the uh, the notion of pseudo Eisenstein series is because technically the proof goes through uh, through analysis of the formula for the L two pairing between two pseudo Eisenstein series. So you'd like to if you'd like to decompose the space, you might as well to decompose decompose the L two pairing, and so then you you have that, uh, or better to say, you can think of a like the L2 pairing have a distribution on two copies of your of your lambda. So lambda, or, or maybe the ball phase lambda is where the is where the lambdas take place. And so on two copies of that, I have a distribution that uh, that tells me what is if I have a corresponding pseudo Eisenstein series, then what is the L2 inner product? And and the spectral decomposition is really decomposition of that distribution into pieces that. Uh, the spectral pieces. And Langlands gives uh, a certain contour integral formula for that distribution. And, and his approach and the approach of all the old people I mentioned on the previous transparency was to do residue calculus in, in that formula, uh, which is which it's that part which you purely avoid. Anyway, so this brings us to a point where I was supposed to make a five minute break. So maybe we make that five minute break now and uh, and you tell me when it ends. Sounds good. Um, so we'll have <clears throat> maybe, yeah, five minutes break. I'm gonna stop the recording in case there are any questions. Uh, please go ahead.